Hello, buddy. Welcome back to the channel. I've got a special guest here today, uh, Ewan, and we met, I think, like two years ago. Um, one of my favorite uh, bars and restaurants here in Dumaguete is a place called Sideways, and Ewan owns it with his wife, Sylvia. It's a great place uh, right on Jose Romero Road, and uh, we got to know each other a little bit. But So, um, how long have you been in the Philippines? Well, I've been coming to the Philippines since 2002, 2003, but then when I met Sylvia in 2009, I came more often, and then eventually, it was my home stop. Instead of going to South Africa, I'd come to the Philippines for my vacations when I was working. Hmm. So uh, your wife, Sylvia, did you meet her? Where did you meet her at? I met her in Manila. Oh, in Manila, okay. Yeah, yeah. And. Um, so what is your, when you were in South Africa, what was your, your profession? What were you doing? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I started off, I finished school at 17 and I joined the Navy. Really? Um, at that time, at that time we had conscription. So mm -hmm. you could join permanent force or you could join, do conscription for two years. I decided on permanent force. And I went into engineering and it's an excellent avenue for study. So I studied in the Navy as well. We went to the technical training schools mm. and universities. So 14 years in the Navy, I left the Navy and then I moved into private industry. I was loaded, I knew everything of course mm. after 14 years in the Navy. And that's where I, after a few years, I started in the brewing industry mm. and I stayed there for the rest of my life. So when you were in the Navy, um, 14 years, that's a long time. You must have liked it if you stayed in it for 14 years. Yeah, I liked it. It's really one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. No kidding. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of former military Navy guys living here in Negros. I've met quite a lot of guys, you know, Navy especially. Mm -hmm. um, did you travel around the world while you were in the Navy too? Did you yeah, a little places? bit. A little we, bit? We, went, we went a big um, blue water Navy like the American Navy, USN or the Royal Navy. Mm -hmm. But we traveled around a little bit. I went to Australia, South America with the Navy, hmm. on Navy ships. And I worked overseas on a, on a project in Israel for a few years. Are you an officer or, or a crewman? Or? Yeah, well, I started off as a rating when I studied, and then I became an officer when I finished my studies. Oh, nice. Mm. And so um, you got out of the Navy and you went into, you said, the brewing industry? Yeah, then I was, I was out of the Navy for a couple of years. I worked in the chemical industry, mm -hmm. which was a lot like the Navy, highly regulated. Mm -hmm. But I needed to change over all my qualifications from Navy to private. And so that took about two years. Mm -hmm. And once done, <coughs> then I joined the breweries, mm -hmm. the brewing industry, South African mm -hmm. breweries. And I stayed with them my whole career. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were doing those other things, like when you were in the Navy and when you were in this other business, um, did it ever cross your mind that, hey, someday I'd like to go to the Philippines and live there? Or was that just the farthest thing from your mind? Or No, I, actually, um, what happened was when I was working for South African breweries, <laughs> I got into, into the channel of sort of plant management and production management. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then I landed up in an old brewery. The brewery was 105 years old. Mm. And they were closing it down, that and two other breweries up the coast, smaller breweries, in which I worked in both. And um, this new mega brewery was being built, state of the art at that time. And then they, the breweries was very good at planning. I mean, they became the second biggest brewery in the world. So there were excellent um, um, resources available. And they said to me, hey, look, you've got a choice. You can move you to another brewery in South Africa, and we're expanding offshore. There's some positions available in China. What do you say? So I took the Chinese option. So you went to China, huh? Yeah, I worked in China for four years. Really? Now, what was that like living in China back then? Um, it was in, from 1999 to 2004, end of 99 to 2004. It was great. It was really eye-opening. Um, in my book, I write quite a bit about the Chinese mm. culture and working within the Chinese culture. So it is completely different. Hmm. And I've heard that it's changed a lot, like, because there's been people that um, I've talked to, went over there and worked there, lived there, and now they say they've kind of gotten um, maybe hostile towards foreigners. They're trying to, I know they shut down a lot of the English schools, the, the guys who were over there teaching English have had to leave, and that it's not as friendly towards foreigners as it used to be. Have you heard that, or you think that's not true? <clears throat> um, I haven't heard it, but I don't think it's true. There, there is just so much, 
so many things to do there. Mm. There's so much knowledge they need in China and mm. um, support they need. They don't really need the support, they can do it all themselves. Mm. But they buy in the technology like they did with us. Right. We were in there for four years mm. and we transferred all our technology, systems, processes. And after four years, they said, hey guys, we can do it. See you, bye bye. Oh, and that's what happened. That's kind of what they're known for, isn't it? Yeah, but it worked. It worked for them. Yeah. Um, when I was working in India in 2012, around there, we were looking at buying some Chinese equipment for India. Mm -hmm. So we went and we looked at some factories. I walked into a factory and on the notice board at the back was this bar chart um, indicating their performance over the last while. Their, their quality parameters. I looked at it and I said, hang on, I recognize that chart. Those were the same charts that we put in, in 2002, mm. 2003. Ten years later, they were still there. Huh. Because once the Chinese government put, or the Chinese business put anything in, it stays. Hmm. Until the, the upper the echelons say, hey, you can move it. But it just stays in place. And those systems worked. Hmm. And they still work to today. Interesting. And so you worked in India too, wow. Yeah, I went from, oh, from China to Angola, from Angola, from, no, from China to India. We had just bought a whole lot of small breweries for a year. Then from there to Angola for four years and then back to India for another four years. What was it like in India for you? Great. It was the second, the first time I was in Mumbai. I've been there, yeah. And it was sort of an outpost and the small mm -hmm. offices only. And um, by the time I got back, um, SAB had consolidated the whole of India and they built their headquarters into Bangalore. And Bangalore was like Valencia is to Dumaguete. It's in the mountains, nice and cool, really nice climate. And then, then there was a hub, a technical hub. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't go back into production. And the second time I was uh, head of, man of packaging. Mm. And um, we traveled from there. There was a whole team of us, a close-knit team. And um, we traveled out from there and it was really good. A lot of travel, because India is so big. But it was very nice. Tell me you had a fascinating life going to all these different countries and living there and experiencing different cultures. So when was the very first time you actually came to the Philippines? Well, now we're going to go back to China. Okay. See, China's got some remarkable systems, very nice systems for expats. Yeah. And they close the whole country down three times a year for a week. But they like spring festival. Yeah. And they've got three weekly holidays throughout the year. And then everything closes, so you go away on holiday. So mm -hmm. my friend and I, um, from China, we were in Xinjiang, northeast of China. We decided to go to the Philippines one year. Mm -hmm. And we really enjoyed it. The next year we did it again. Mm -hmm. So th that's how it happened. Did you actually, th with those, on those trips, did it ever cross your mind, say, you know what, I could, I could live here? Yeah, actually it did. It did, huh? Yeah, it did. It, that was back in 2002, 2003. Hmm. Yeah, it's a nice place to live in. You know, you live in. Oh, I know, well. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's changed my An life. An easy place to live in, easy going. The people, most of the people can speak English. Yeah. And, that's um, a big, that's a, such a big plus. It really is. You yeah. know, can't, I was in Thailand recently and it's a lovely country and I really liked a lot of things about it, but I had a hard time because nobody spoke English. I went into a 7-Eleven and tried to buy a cup of coffee and he didn't understand what I was talking about, you know, and so uh, that's what's nice about the Philippines. And so um, you met your wife, and um, did you get married in the Philippines, or? Uh, yes, eventually we had to get married in the Philippines. Now, Sylvia lived in America for a while, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Before she met you? That's right. Wow, so because her English is excellent, you know, you never even know she's from the Philippines. Um, and so, when did you guys decide that you wanted to uh, open a restaurant or bar? I mean, because that's such a hard thing to do, I would think. Well, if you, if you go back to around about 2014 and 15, that's when we started putting our retirement plans in place. Mm. And then we, wanted to, then we looked at where we were going to go. Mm. So we went on these, this route march around um, the Philippines. We went to different places, had a look at them, trying to decide where we want to be. And Dumaguete came up and we came back here two or three times. And Sylvia came alone as well because she's got a friend from here. Hmm. And two or three times we came down to Dumaguete um, to have a look, to decide. And eventually we said, okay, this is it. See, guys like you 
did my work for me because when I came here, I didn't go anyplace. I came right here to start with because of YouTube channels. I saw the guys talking about it, but, but men like you who've traveled all over and they decided this is where they wanted to be. And mm -hmm. I said, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And I still want to see the rest of the Philippines, but I think that, you know, I made the right decision too because I'm really happy here as well. Um, now, I was in, in your restaurant the other day and you were telling me that you wrote a book. And I said, wow, you wrote a book? And that's really impressive. So tell me a little bit about your book. Well, what happened? Um, in my last job, I was in Ethiopia, right? Wow. Um, I'd retired. And a few months later, I landed up in Ethiopia on a two-year contract and to, get a, to get a brewery up and running, operational readiness side of the brewery as part of the project team. Now, one question. On this brewery, was it all the same, the same brand of beer? Were they all different kinds of beer? Oh, or what no, was the brand? The, 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 this, year, this year was a different brewery. It's a single stream brewery to start with. Hmm. That means it only made one brand. Okay. But um, let me talk about that brewery quickly. That, that was one of the, the first fully automated breweries, auto, um, brew houses hmm. um, in the world. There were six others and um, in the world total and that was number four that went in at the Mura brew house so it was leading edge technology and the big comment was from the other brewers like Heineken as an example and Diageo um, they say, said hey you guys are bitten off more than you can chew you'll never get this brewery to run hmm. and um, we got the brewery to run and it ran damn well have you ever thought about opening your own like microbrewery? I know that's a big popular thing in America. Now, isn't there a place on here in Dumaguete where a guy has, they have micro beers? I think it's somewhere down here. Yeah, Betty Num Num. Right, we, yeah. We, we buy their beer. I, I mentioned their brand, Kuan brand. Yeah, yeah. On, yeah, they, they're very nice beer. But you no, they've got a small I think brewery with your expertise there. though, haven't you no. ever thought about like no. doing a little microbrewery or something? No, not, not really. interested. <laughs> no, my friend, one of the team from India, he sort of dabbles in microbreweries when he's not building breweries other places. Mm -hmm. And um, he makes um, craft beer for his favorite pub. Mm -hmm. And he takes it down. He lives in Saikun in Hong Kong. And he takes it down to his local pub and they drink it there. Mm -hmm. They sell it and they drink it. Yeah, he loves microbreweries. He's a brewer. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm an engineer. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Hey, I know how much trouble it is making beer. It's a really hard work making good quality beer. Mm. You know, with the hygiene standards, with the focusing on and making sure everything happens at the right time. Yeah. It's, you know. When I was uh, young traveling around the world, um, I was real snobby about beer. I'd only drink American beer. And I was drinking like Miller and Budweiser and on a cruise ship, you know, drinking that beer and um, never even trying the other beers. Then finally, after many years, I think I was in England and someone took me to an English pub and the beer they were making there, I don't remember what the brand was, but they've been making it there at that particular pub for like 700 years. You know, the same recipe, they made it right there and served it on tap. And once you tasted something like that, you go, wow, this is just amazing. And then I started trying all these other beers and, and now I won't touch American beer. None of those, I won't drink any of them, you know. Yeah. Like here in Philippines, we have San Miguel. I think that's a really good beer. I like it. It is a very good beer. You know, I was surprised. I mean, I think it's a really good beer. Hmm. So um, let's go back to your book. Now, tell me a little bit about okay, the book. Okay, so um, we, we got the brewery going. Yeah. Okay, we had a lot of African type complications, right. which built in delays. Then eventually we got the, beer, the, the brewery running, and then it was running. Then it had to be ramped up. <clears throat> that took another year because that is the first round of a bit of political unrest in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And now they're close to civil war after I left. But anyway, um, that is the first round. So that was a hiccup. Then my contract was coming to an end and the CEO said to me, hey, I've got a job for you. You've got to get two people. They had a sister brewery up in Gonda. You've got to train two plant managers, one to take over from you and one to run the other plant. Mm. And I said, great, I'll do it. Okay, and um, it's a legacy I was leaving behind. I wanted to leave it behind. Mm -hmm. So we started working on that. And then when I'd finished, uh, our, our mission was accomplished. They were trained, they took over, they ran the brewery successfully. And then when I got to, back to the Philippines, I had a few months to wait for Sylvia to retire. She went on early retirement from World Health Organization. 
And then I said, hang on, let me write about my experiences. Hmm. So I, I wrote them up and it was like a sort of a operating practice in a cover. Right. It wasn't very good. And a friend of mine, who was from South Africa as well, he was also in the Navy, he had a look at it and he said, you know, this book is a gem. There's just so much information here. But wow. your presentation is crap. Hmm. Let's redo it. Hmm. So under his guidelines and auspices, I redid it. And hmm. we rewrote that whole book. And we got it knocked into shape, as they say. And this is a new book. And another friend of mine... Uh, Just hold a, it up. Hold it up so people can see it. <laughs> um, yeah, Navigating the Perils of Mass Production. Nice. And where is it available at? Where can you buy it? Uh, you can buy it at Amazon. Oh, great. Um, UK, Amazon America. Um, I've posted it on Facebook with the links. Yeah. And you can buy it at the bar for 600 pesos. Okay. If you want one, I'll sign it for you as well. Okay. Um, for 600 pesos. And that's a deal coming in from, I bought them in from Amazon UK. Mm. Um, and the, the feedback I've got on the book so far is it's, it's nice, easy flowing, good stories and a lot of gems. There's a lot of information in there. It doesn't tell you what to do. It doesn't tell you Six Sigma. It doesn't tell you how to implement um, Kaizen or mm -hmm. anything like that. It doesn't tell you which maintenance management system to use, but it tells you all about the infrastructure, how to use them, what you should have in place to be able to use them. And then things, of course, people never tell you about your boss, about the system, why things happen. Mm -hmm. They're all in there. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, wow. It's like a fast tracking. It's like 20 years of management experience into two hours of reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, best of luck with that. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your first book then, huh? Well, it's a second edition in my first book, yeah. Hmm. Wow. So you have plans to write anything else or you think you'll continue on doing that? Or? No, not at this time. Um, mm. Possibly if we retire again, mm. huh. you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Although we're having such fun now at the bar, so... Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Sideways. Um, mm -hmm. How long have you had uh, your bar restaurant? Well, two and a half years now. Two and a half years, mm -hmm. and how's it going? It's going okay. You know, everybody struggled during, struggled during COVID period because of the restrictions imposed on us, people not allowed to move mm -hmm. in and out, 50% capacity, no tourists coming in and out. Right. But anyway, it's all turning around again slowly. Um, so business is picking up. We've seen a month-on-month -month pick up yeah. in business. Um, not big steps, small steps. Okay, but um, one of the downs, the downside of it is, is with the problems they're having with Russia and Ukraine and the oil price. Everything's gone up. Oh, Inflation really? Inflation is hitting us everywhere. Yeah, that's so, a good question. Like food prices, for example. Like I don't really look at the price of something when I go shopping because if you need it, you need it, so I just buy it. But um, what is it like, um, you notice like, say, you know, chicken and beef and your, things you buy all the time, yeah. what percentage do you think that they've gone up? Around about 30%. Really, 30%, that's yeah. a lot. That's a lot. And then you know, the, the, the support for the brewery, uh, not for the brewery, for the bar, um, like the gas for cooking, mm -hmm. that's gone up nearly 100%, the same as your fuel. The cooking for oil, for your French fries, yeah. for frying things, that's gone up proportionally. It's also just about doubled in price. Really? So th those are the things that are underlined. Fruit and veg, they've been, they went up during COVID, but they stayed pretty consistent. And now slowly all the imported stuff's going up, like the wines are starting to go up. Fortunately, we don't sell any imported beer. Mm. Um, but all your Jamesons, your whiskies are all going up because they... Peso to the dollar is now 55 to 1. Hmm. You know, so... And they're blaming it all on Ukraine? Like, I don't see how Ukraine could really be the reason for this, you know? I don't blame it on Ukraine, but I think they sparked the fire. Um, huh. When the oil prices went up. I mean, the oil prices have nearly doubled, or have doubled. I heard oil and went down. Well, they're starting to come down again. Yeah, quite a it's bit, actually. It's a whole case of supply and demand in that. The world's getting into sync and getting into balance. Remember, um, la I think it was last year, early last year, where oil was so low that if you wanted to sell me a barrel of oil, you had to pay me like $20 to take it. 
It was as negative. Bad. It wasn't a, a bit of exaggeration. It yeah. wasn't as bad as that. But yeah, the oil price dropped out the markets, supply and demand. But when the, there was the, no air travel. Right. There was no sea travel. Yeah. Nobody was driving their cars around because they couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. So everything, there was no demand. So the price dropped. But when that happened, though, did your price of food and stuff go down? Or did it stay the same? Well, we weren't selling that much food because we were restricted. Yeah. But, I mean, if you, wanted, <laughs> if, you were buying it, if you wanted to buy it, though, was the prices low? No, the prices were very stable then. Yeah, so Everything it's like, was stable. Price, oil goes down, prices stay the same. Retail, oil goes up, the prices go up. Retail pricing will go up. It will never come down. Hmm. But it will stabilize. Hmm. You learn to work around it. So I guess the Philippines is no different than any place else as far as... I, I've just noticed like gas has gone up, electricity has gone up. I haven't really noticed the food so much, but... Uh, the, funny enough, electricity hasn't gone up. It hasn't? Electricity is very consistent as well. Well, it seems like since I've been here, it's gone up. I don't know. I think it went up a few, about a year ago, six months to a year ago. Yeah. They brought in a new pricing structure, yeah. and everybody went up. We went up by about 3,000 pesos a month, and since then we've been stable. Here you'd think it would be real cheap because it's geothermal. You know, you'd think that would be the most efficient and cheapest energy you could possibly get. But somebody said they sold off the, the power plants, they uh, privatized them or something, and that uh, so for them they're trying to make a profit <coughs> off it. I don't know. But, I don't know about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's really great. You know, thank you so much for uh, sitting down with me and uh, sharing your story, and I hope you do really well with your book. And uh, again, the restaurant is Sideways. It's on Jose Romero Road. I highly recommend it. It's uh, a lot of expats hang out there. The food is excellent. They have darts there, and they have little events and stuff going on throughout the week. And uh, it's a really great place, especially if you're coming here for the first time and you want to meet some new friends. A lot of really nice guys hang out down there. So thanks a lot for your time. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'll be there uh, at your restaurant sometime this week, I'm sure. Okay, Mark. Thanks very much. Cheers. My, my pleasure.